Hi, everyone. Hi. How nice. People. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, so my name is Claudia Zini and I'm the director of Kuma International in Sarajevo. I'm really pleased that you are joining us tonight for another conversation uh, with artists. This is part of the program that Kuma launched uh, already last year, uh, Artists in Conversations. And we are talking to artists who are originally from Bosnia, but now live in, uh, in diaspora. And we started last December, uh, this, the first round of co four conversations, and we talked to Velma Babic uh, in Germany, um, Anna Cvorovic in, in the UK, uh, Selma Chatovic uh, um, in the Emirates, and, uh, and Veli Borbojevic in Canada. And then uh, those conversations were, went just uh, so well that we decided to continue uh, because there are many, uh, many talented artists, friends and colleagues uh, from Bosnia living in diaspora. So um, who are actually because of pandemic, uh, they are not, uh, they were not able, uh, they are still not able, unfortunately, to travel and see us in Sarajevo. So we decided to continue to hold these conversations online. So continuing uh, talking about diasporic identity, uh, memory, uh, and the preservation of history. And today I am really excited and really happy to welcome Xenia Hotic. Uh, she's joining us from Toronto in Canada. And Xenia is a freelancer photographer and cookbook food stylist. So welcome Xenia. I'm really happy to have you at Kuma International for the first time, but not the last time for sure. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thanks for the intro. Thank you for the invite. Thank, Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I wish it was in person, but... Uh, it will be next time. Next year. Sure. Yeah. So next I'm, time. Really, I'm really excited to, to present my, my work and a bit of my journey with you. Um, and I guess I will start with an introduction of who I am and uh, how I got here. So I'm based in Toronto, Canada. We moved here in 1995. Uh, I was born in Kluc in Bosnia. Kluc is in the northwest uh, of Bosnia. And um, I, you know, we, we lived a very kind of natural life. It was quite idyllic in many ways. Uh, unfortunately, the war, you know, severed all that. So in 92, we were forced to leave. Uh, it took us a good half a year to get out. Um, when we did, we fled quite a bit. I believe we fled about 14 times. Um, for a few months, we were kind of homeless, uh, but we ended up in Berlin, luckily, and stayed there for three years. And um, we waited for some papers to come through, and then we were sponsored to go to Canada. So we've lived in Canada and Toronto since 95. Um, while I was here, um, I worked in a German delicatessen, so I was able to keep my German. And then I decided it was uh, good and dear to me to keep German around, and I ended up studying it. So I did a sociology and a German studies double major, which was very interesting, and I'm glad I did that. And then I ended up being hired by uh, a hospital called CAMH, or the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, where I worked for 11 years. Um, and I'll get into that later. Photography was sort of always in the background, but never in the foreground until now. So um, while I was working at CAMH, I felt a little burnt out and I started to do things that I really enjoyed on the side. So that was cooking, food events and photography. Um, and through those things, uh, I was approached to do a cookbook by one of the cooks that I had worked with. So. Here we are, three books later, um, and uh, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. And maybe some of the photos uh, here are actually quite uh, relevant. So this is the one on the right with the mountains. It's obviously in Bosnia. My father took that. This is uh, close to Šabić, uh, where he actually taught as a Russian teacher and a Bosnian language teacher in the late 70s. Um, this was at that time very far away, so nobody could get to it. But he went there with his hunting gun and his hunting gear, and he worked there for quite a while. Um, and the other two are me in Toronto. And then the bottom left with all the people is, this is the market that uh, a few friends of mine and I that we ran um, and we would have about 2,000 people show up. And we had 50 different vendors from different places. So all these things somehow emerged. 
Okay, moving on. Okay, so. Xenia, so when and how did you go from sociology to photography and then culinary world? And why did you merge photography with the culinary field? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't think that photography would be a career. Um, although I did apply for journalism and I, and, you know, I was accepted, but I, I declined for other personal reasons. So, you know, photography and the culinary world, why? I don't think I, I ever meant to do this in a sense. I certainly wasn't planning on it. It sort of happened around me and to me and I embraced it because I saw myself in it. Um, like I said, I worked in the healthcare field. It was in mental health. There was a lot of things in that field that I was drawn to learn about and understand, primarily the trauma aspect of it and the resilience of many of the clients and then some of the therapeutic modalities as well. Um, but, you know, I felt like I was there for a very long time and I wasn't able to be creative. It was a very stressful place, a high workload, although very meaningful, but, uh, it was, it was a bit too much at times. So I started to cook more and I started to do these fun events with my friends. And then that sort of just kind of accumulated, you know, as things do and the photography, you know, I studied photography in high school and in university as minors, I suppose. And um, my friend just kept asking me, just do the photos, you know, you're good. And we need newspapers and, you know, all these other articles. And, you know, they kept publishing and publishing. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe this is not a bad idea to try, to at least give it a try. So in 2016, I quit at the hospital. It was December 31st. I quit on New Year's, <laughs> like at 11.50. I'm like, okay, a new year, new beginning. So... Yeah, and uh, in school, I also had studied migration, you know, and heritage preservation, um, you know, so all these things essentially kind of just lined up. And I, and I found that because, you know, I come from a traumatized nation, you know, there's just no other way to say it, um, you know, and, and I worked through it in my own way with my friends and family and community. Um, you know, I, I felt that having been exposed to so many different mental health issues through my work and some of my studies, that somehow this notion of repression, you know, repression, avoidance is our coping mechanisms, as we know, you know, they were kind of wiping out some of the things that were dear to me as well. And I, and I didn't think that that was a, a way that I wanted to live. So I started to bring back the things that gave me joy. I started to dive back and talk to my father primarily and my mother. You know, do you remember this? And do you remember that? And how do I make this? And how do I make that? And I remember this tasting like this. So all these kind of healthier memories started popping up. And um, then I started writing in my, in my little notebooks all over the place and writing about these books and food and cookbooks. Maybe one day I'll do a cookbook, you know, many years ago. Anyway, that was on hold because, um, you know, I was working, I had to make a living. So I also then realized through more of the creative uh, exercises that I was doing that, you know, trauma can be healed in many different ways, right? So we know, you know, there's the medical field, the, the, the therapy, the holistic, but I think also the senses, our senses and our memories in our body, you know, um, really kind of hold all that information. and. I did read and it stuck with me and I understand it now that, you know, your sense of, of smell, for example, and taste trigger, um, you know, memory, not necessarily trauma, but memory the most. So that was very important to me. And I thought to myself, well, that's important because if I'm making a dish that reminds me of home and that smells like home, maybe the good memories will kind of be there. And a lot of the time I would make certain foods and my friends would walk in um, and be like, oh my God, is that, is that what I think it is? I'm like, yep, yeah, making sadness today. And they're like, oh, okay, great, I'm coming, you know? And so stuff like that, I think it's very important. Um, anyway, I could talk about this for a long time, but I think you get the idea. So then I also believe in storytelling. You know, we are here from stories. My father's stories, his little poetry that he still writes to me are things that give me so much energy and connect me to back home. And um, I just, I just want to do this because I miss home so much. Um, it's my only home, you know, and, and, and yes, I live in Canada and I feel great here, but um, anyway, I, I feel like I'm traveling through this book in a sense to go back home. And again, some of the photos are from huge from my trip there last time. 
starting with the first thing that comes, you know, out in spring and I see Amelie's watching, um, you know, we have a, a shared experience of metal and what it means to us. And then some of the fruit, you know, the dunya and some of the wild, wild pears that I keep writing about and, and apples and so on and so forth. You know, of course, the, the mushrooms that my father always loved to forage. And then, you know, the village of Lukomir, which is, again, a place that my father spent a lot of time in with the locals, uh, you know, watching the folklore, listening to the stories, eating the foods, you know, eating the, the cheese there and the bread that he says he's never been able to eat anywhere else. So all these things, again, combine. Um, and, and here we are. So I'll move on to the next slide. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, you know, I thought it was important to talk a little bit about my current life. You know, I mean, I, I'm 40. I just turned 40 last week. So, you know, it's not like I'm just a diaspora, uh, you know, from Bosnia. You know, I also have other aspects of me in other places that I lived in longer than I lived in Bosnia, although I mostly feel like a Bosnian soul. So, my life in Toronto is interesting. I, I feel very grateful to be here because in a sense, you know, I came with my pain and my identity loss, but so did most of my other friends. You know, they may not all be war refugees, but a lot of them are. And a lot of them come from, you know, the Middle East. Uh, many of them come from, you know, political unrest in, in, in South or Central America, you know. Um, my friends are from Cuba. My closest friends are Armenia, Iraq. I mean, I could read it, but I let you guys read that on your own. It's, it's a very international circle of friends that I, I now start to call family. Um, and we do these gatherings now. You know, I started doing this, you know, in groups of four to eight. And now we've had a patio with close to 30 people, potluck. So I just ask everyone to bring something from their homeland, and they do. And we share and we talk about it and uh, it's wonderful. I think Canada is, you know, is huge, but I think Toronto is a very special place for that because we really are able to, to understand each other. So, you know, other than that, um, we also share a lot of music events, you know, and in, in Bosnia, we have that notion of chafe, you know, and, and hanging out. And here it's, it's something that needs to be um, worked a little harder towards. It's not something that happens naturally. So I think it's important to foster that. And I think, you know, I, I'd like to think that I'm a member of, of that community that nurtures it. So there's usually food and then there's music. And we've actually started bands that play Balkan music. One is from Iraq and, and uh, Ukraine and a man from Belgrade. So all these things kind of come together. And, you know, I think Bojo Vrecho asked our friend Ahmed, who's from Iraq, to open for him with another band. So all these things are starting to kind of intertwine and it's quite, quite wonderful. Um, and then, uh, you know, my, my current life after working in psychiatry and in education, how to make a cookbook. People sometimes ask me, what do you do? Do you just cook it and shoot it? And usually yes, but there's a lot more to it. So, you know, I believe that this is an important task and, you know, I just kind of wanted to break it down a little bit. So it's, it's a long process, you know, it takes a lot of research. So I'll go through the points. Um, and also for Bosnia, for me, and I actually have some things set aside, you know, I, I believe in the visual representation of things as well. So when you're making a cookbook, you know, unless you're doing something that's very simple, you actually do need to bring elements, visual elements in as well. So, you know, it's not a lot of stuff, but you know, I actually took it upon myself to find things from my family, like this, my grandma made this, like, you know, and it's like one of those things that my mom stuffed somewhere with her passport uh, when we left that day. And then, you know, my dad was given this when he worked in Shavich. Um, That was the other thing that was in that thing that was saved by my aunt after we fled that night. So all these things, you know, I plan on using, you know, these little dishes like this is from Sarajevo. I don't know if you guys can see that. I don't want to bore you with these things, but they give me a lot of joy. This, you know, this little box with all these little things. So all these things are, you know, aspects of the book that I'm going to include. And then, for example, I was traveling with my friend Ivy to the States last year and there was an antique store. So we went in and she calls me yelling, yelling across the store, Sanya, get over here. Okay, what is it? So look what I found. So she found a little Jezwa 
but it's made in Yugoslavia. So, you know, I mean, I, it's so silly. It's like an old little thing with rust on it, but I cried. So <laughs> all these missing pieces kind of coming together. Um, so yeah, all those things are important when you're making a cookbook. And then of course you have to write the introduction. You have to figure out what your table of contents is, which meals are you going to, to talk about? You have to write the recipes, which is the most important, and then you have to test them as well. And then of course, then when all that is done, you can start photographing and cooking and styling the food. Um, and then of course other content, and then yeah, hopefully you'll find a very good agent or they'll, they'll find you. And, then you make your proposal and that goes to publishers and so on and so forth. Hopefully the rest is, is all good news. So moving on. So this is an excerpt from my, um, from my proposal. So what I'm talking about here is the cabbage roll, the sarma, and um, the importance of it and what it means to me and, and how it ties into my current life. You know, like my friends from Romania, Armenia, and many other places uh, have something very similar. So. I thought it was important to talk about the connection to other cultures. Okay, so, oops. Here we go. So. This one here, okay. Can you tell us about the cookbooks that you've uh, worked on? Sure, so the first cookbook I did was in 2016 and 2017. That was the year after I quit working at the hospital. So that was called The Great Shellfish Cookbook. It was about sustainable shellfish in Canada. Um, and that was picked up by Penguin Random House and published um, as well. The second one I just finished last month, that was a COVID cookbook. It was with a Canadian chef called Trish Magwood and it's a farm to table cookbook. And we were actually just signed with Penguin Random House as well again, which is amazing. And that's uh, going to be available late fall this year. Um, currently, I am working on the Depaneur cookbook, which is a restaurant that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So I'll leave that. And then I started working on this Bosnian cookbook uh, about two years ago and uh, spent some time in, in, in Bosnia doing research and taking some photos and, you know, kind of mastering a few recipes. So that's been on hold due to COVID and also, you know, because I was busy making those other two books um and so on and so forth so why you know why i make cookbooks for a living um was not clear to me that i would find meaning in this so i thought oh, okay i'll just do one and i'll see how it goes and you know it, it's it's a nice it's a nice job um and as i sat with it and wrote about it more and looked at some of my you know work from university and from my job and, and trauma i realized that you know, maybe I am meant to do a little bit more of these cookbooks because they are parts of our kind of history and heritage, um, you know, and all those things I talked about before, how food can bring memories and reclaim lost things. I think it's very important. So I found meaning um, in this. And of course, you know, I'm putting a lot more into it because of my journey here and how it happened, you know, when you kind of ripped out of your soil, you know, it's, it's different. You, you fight harder to, to remain you know, as a remnant even. So um, I'm trying to reclaim a bit of our heritage, a little bit of our story, especially my, my parents' story. You know, I think they're incredible people. Um, they've done so much for the community. Um, and I just, I just think uh, it would be a nice, a nice thing to do to have for them as well. Um, and what else can I say here? Yeah, I guess the, the other thing that I miss the most and that I always wanted to somehow you know, give some work and energy to was the preservation of nature in Bosnia. Um, we really grew up, you know, in the mountains. I would go hunting and fishing with my dad. That was like our soccer practice, you know. You know, we would go foraging with empty bags. He would take his whole class out and say, okay, kids, I found a ton of mushrooms. You know, this is how you pick them. We're gonna go. And so we would go. Or, and then he'd be like, okay, now we're going tree planting. <laughs> so we would take the class and go tree planting. Uh, you know, all these things were ways of life, but they were really important. And um, I, I think they kept my father sane, um, you know, this connection to nature. And I see how much it means to him. And at the end of the presentation, we'll watch a little video so you'll understand a little bit more. So just to talk about these photos here, um, this is Sarajevo. This is our homemade sudruk 
which um, my father has been making here for 20 years. He made, builds a smokehouse, Sushnitsa, and then he tears it down every year and then we plant a herb garden on it. So um, there's also me doing a cooking class on sadman because we also pickle our own cabbage for the sadman. We smoke our own land meat for it. So, and then my brother, Anis, who you know, is a fisherman as well as my father and my grandfather were. And um, now he catches salmon instead of trout, let's say, or the grayling. And down uh, on the bottom right is me cooking at the Deconer. So this is a photo from a while ago. Um, it's when I had one of my Bosnian soccer clubs, which I've done over 30, close to 40. So it's, it's all sort of tying in together. So let's move on to the next slide. Right, so this is to talk about the Deconer cookbook with Len. Um, so this cookbook uh, was something that we wanted to do years ago and because COVID happened, we finally had some time to, to get to it. So the cookbook is very interesting. We started it as a Kickstarter, as a fundraiser, because we wanted to see if people would pre-purchase the book, if it's something they would be interested in. So the Kickstarter, um, we did for a month, you know, and we were paying attention, but not that much. Anyway, the following day, 20 hours later, we had raised something like 15,000. And we were both like, this is what? What? Like we were just in shock. And in a matter of like five days or a week, we had raised 60,000. So uh, it was the biggest and most funded Kickstarter uh, cookbook ever for Kickstarter. So we got an award from Kickstarter as well. So we realized, okay, we, we this is good. Like this is wholesome, you know, we have, hundreds and hundreds of people who come from different places in Toronto and, and I think we can highlight them now. So we are. So I'm there every day. I've been doing it for over a month because it was a time where I was doing both books. So now I'm just doing this one. And we've already uh, photographed about 45 recipes. Uh, we have a recipe editor, we have a writer, and we decided to follow a very similar format for this cookbook as The Humans of New York. So we're going to tell people stories, whether it's quirky or food related or immigration related, we thought it was important to talk about more than just the food. So, so I'm just going to go through some of these because they're interesting. On the left there, th those are momos, so they're dumplings from Tibet. Um, beside them is a Haitian soup out of root vegetables, which is delicious. On the bottom there is uh, chicken feet, which you know, I didn't eat sometimes like I have in soups, but I thought it was really pretty. So um, that happens a lot in, in these shoots. And above is, you know, is challah, the bread, and below is, is, you know, mushroom stewed with homemade hummus. And then there's me teaching a class at the Dep uh, as well. Um, uh, Uzbekistan, that was also dumplings. Uh, the other, the young man below there is um, making a Japanese yogurt cake, Above that is Bayesian food. So this is sweet potato and pumpkin wrapped in banana leaves with a lot of spices. It's delicious, you steam it. And then on the right side is Len Senator. So he's the owner and the founder of the Dep. He's been a very, very close friend of mine as well. So that's who I'm working with on the Dep in our cookbook. And then we have Seville Marmalade, which um, is delicious. And I just had to put it in there. So all those things, very different recipes and uh, hopefully the stories will be um, representative of the experience of these people. Okay, so now we're moving on to... One more question for you. Um, how did the connection between cooking and photography start for you? Right, so cooking was something that I, I always enjoyed, uh, even as a child with my grandma, you know, dad made me this tool, this camellia, you know, to to stand up so I could see what grandma was doing because I kept pulling, you know, on, on the stove and stuff. And it's dangerous at that time. It was a wood stove, right? So, so I guess it started early. You know, dad was really involved in gathering food and hunting food. So he would go hunting and we would have rabbit trahana quite often, you know. Um, he would bring mushrooms home so all the neighbors would come and we would make mushrooms. We would dry mushrooms and we would powder them to have it for soup. Uh, so food was always there. Uh, I guess the only time it wasn't there was in Berlin because we were just so lost for those two, three years. So there was no access to any of that stuff. Um, and then when I started working at the food market, 
um, uh, I realized that, you know, there are 50 vendors here and not a single one of them is Balkan, which is totally okay, but I can do that and maybe people will like some of our food. So I just did it as a test the first time and I sold out in a few hours of the cabbage rolls and I was really surprised. So that helped, you know, all these things you have to try to see if they make sense and it's the way I like to learn, you know, I, I have a hard time assuming it'll work until it does. Um, so that happened. Um, and then, you know, talking about documentary photography. So in university, I studied photography and the documentary aspect of it was so, so important to me that, um, you know, I actually wanted to switch careers and go into journalism um, and, you know, be a war journalist or, or documented in some capacity. So maybe it's a good thing that I didn't. My parents were quite worried about me doing that. And, you know, the war was still sort of very fresh in our minds. So maybe, maybe it's good that I didn't do it at that time. So. Yeah, all these things, again, are becoming a document. Um, and so cooking, storytelling, these images, me being a photographer, having the technical skills, um, all those things worked. And then as time went on, I went through some health issues a few years ago. I'm, I'm, I'm okay now. But, you know, I was working on, on healing, you know, healing my body, healing my outlook on life, healing the rest of my life and, and how I want to live it. So, you know, I read a lot and I read a lot on, on things that are important on, on how to move on. In university, I was very much uh, into the German studies uh, class. And, and there we talked about, you know, that notion and I guess movement uh, of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which is really coming to terms with the past. Um, so, you know, I, I believe in reconciliation through a healthy way. Um, and food again, you know, came to mind. And so did music, you know, um, I mean, I work with musicians in other realms of my profession, but I, I, you know, I'm not a musician and I don't know how to read music yet and so on and so forth. So I thought maybe I can do something with this food and trauma experience. So, so I sort of did. And as it went on, I started doing pop-ups um, and guest dinners and talking to different people from back home. And it became a little collective, you know, and we support each other now. And I think that has to do again with, the lost identity coming together and collecting ourselves and becoming a part of it again. It takes a lot of effort um, and we don't have a lot of support. We don't have a lot of mentorship. People are busy and people are tired and it's not, those are not good excuses, but I think, I think we need to be aware of that, that the, you know, the people who had to leave home and were able to leave um, need to be given a little bit more direction, you know, and um, the elders hold the knowledge about our culture. You know, there's no way that I can know as much as, as my parents. So, again, the storytelling through the food and photography made sense for me. Um, and also, you know, two of my major inspirations uh, while I was studying were, you know, Mr. James Baldwin and, and Dorothea Lange. So James Baldwin, you know, my, one of my favorite minds of, of the century, you know, he kind of coined the term artivism, you know, act and activism and art and artivism. I mean, it just made sense for me. It really rang a bell with me. Um, he believes, you know, and, you know, so many other people do as well, but really telling the, your story in your times, in your way, you know, in your community. And uh, I really valued that. So I hope that this book will be at least a little bit of that. Um, and then Dorothea Lange, who photographed, you know, the actual the actual economy of people who are poor in, in the US, you know, and wasn't sugarcoating anything, um, you know, or hiding anything, it was really as raw as it gets. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, to do more of that. Um, and I think Kuma International really helps to give us a space to practice these things because we need to get it out of us. It's a part of us, it needs to go through us. We can't hold on to all these memories and things. Um, they have to have a place, they have to evolve, we have to expand together, you know, I think. It gets heavy when you hold on to things. So, yeah, so food and being the common language, essentially, um, and being used as a, you know, a diplomatic tool. It's gastro diplomacy. There's such a thing. Okay, so let's move on. Kadi, how are we for time? I'm just, we're we, still. We are perfect with time. So just. Uh, okay, good. Yes. Okay, so what's next? That's funny, it jumps. Okay, so here we are. Maybe I'll go back to this slide actually, just briefly. Um, so 
This is uh, one of my favorite photos of my parents. This was taken the summer before COVID where they grew these humongous tomatoes um, and, and the, the fig trees had finally come through. So my dad called, you know, very excited saying, I just ate a fig and it's ready. Come over, we're gonna eat all the figs. So we practice all these things as much as we can um, from back home. You know, and then above is his smoked meat and mama's baklava, you know, and I made the pita, I believe, and uh, maslanitsa. So, you know, when we get together, we try to kind of, you know, make the food that reminds us of home. On the bottom left is a photo of my father and my brother. This is on our balcony in Kyuch. And, you know, here's dad who brought a fish home. And I don't think my brother could even stand, but, you know, he was exposed to fishing. So dad was very, very, very involved in the hunting and fishing society. He made, um, you know, the flies for fishing. He would go and collect, uh, you know, certain feathers from certain birds at certain times of the year because he liked the iridescence of a feather and he knew that, you know, the grayling liked it at this time. So it was a very um, visceral experience for me to grow up around that. You know, there were nights where he was working on this thing that looked like a microscope, you know, which is sort of maybe is a microscope and he would make these things underneath. And then he would have all these people come through and bring him feathers or bring him material. <laughs> it was quite, quite intricate. Um, so fish and fishing and fresh water is, uh, again, a big part of my upbringing. So there's me in Lukumir above when dad took me there for the first time a few years ago. And then one of my favorite photos of driving um, between Shavuch and Lukumir, which I could look at this photo forever. So just really wonderful memories. Okay, so now we are moving on to the next slide before my computer jumps to the end. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I was asked a little bit to talk about, you know, the food as a Bosnian diaspora and what that means. So, you know, having just spoken about it a little bit, I did grow up uh, in, in sort of nature. We were, we lived in the city uh, in an apartment and we were building a house, but really outside of the city, just on the, on the, on the edge of the, of the city, we had land. So we would grow vegetables on one and then we would grow crops and corn on the other one. And, you know, it's not something that we had to do or necessarily needed to do. It's something that my parents did because it, they were raised that way as well. So, you know, the neighbors from the building, a lot of my dad's students, we would all go to, to the land and we would do these things together. And when it was harvest season, everybody would come and we would have a big feast or a party. So, um, you know, losing all that, all of it, the people, literally, um, you know, losing your title as a teacher, losing your neighbors as friends, as we know, you know, it was a lot of hardships that went on losing the land, losing your language, losing your heritage, all of it was lost. So it's not, you know, it's not something that you're conscious of because you're living in the survival mode, but 20, 30 years later, you know, as you're reading through things and you're drawn to other people's stories, you realize that being a diaspora is a process and it's something that's worthwhile exploring. So, you know, if you were to break it down as a, you know, kind of sociolo sociological, uh, phenomena, you know, being a refugee as well, there are a lot of um, steps to recovering. Um, so, you know, Bosnia was that. We also had a lot of uh, friends in the rural villages, especially my father who went fishing there a lot. So, so the rural kind of, you know, dignity of ingredients and the intelligence of the rural way of life is something that was instilled in my brother and I, and it still is until today. We'll still go out of the city for the land, for example, or I'll go get maple syrup from a farm because I know it's authentic and real. So then we, when we moved to Berlin, you know, I don't think we even had time to think about that. There was no going anywhere. We went fishing a few times and that was sort of nice, but the war was still active. Most of my mother's family was stuck there. It was, it was horrendous. Um, so the food was not really something we could practice. And then when we came to Canada, it took a good 10 years for us to sort of get up on our feet, you know, didn't speak the language, had to learn the language, you know, all the things that everybody has to go through. You know, finally, my brother and I learned the language, we both finished school and we started to sort of work. And, and through that, you know, you make a living and my parents and, I, and, and us bought a house with a bit of land. And then we started gardening. So this is now 20 years after the war. 
and they started to feel better. They started to feel healthier. They were more joyful. And we realized in the summer, their mood is entirely different than in the winter. Well, in the winter, there was no garden, right? There was no going outside. There was no fishing. Uh, but then my brother and I started to do other things. So we would take them foraging here. My brother learned how to go salmon fishing and told dad about salmon, you know? And so now they go salmon fishing and we have salmon all year round. They've traveled to Sweden. They've traveled to Northern Ontario and Quebec and so many faraway places, the East Coast. Um, you know, there was a trip to Nunavut. <laughs> so they're really kind of re-embracing what they miss about being back home in Canada, which is, it's, it's, it's very nice to see. It just took a long time to get here. Um, and what else? Uh, food as a diaspora. So right, the dinners that I've done at the, at the deck, at the depreneur, also allowed me to sort of talk about anything I wanted to. And whenever, you know, I would sort of ask people what they wanted to hear about, they really wanted to hear about the journey. Uh, and, and eventually it became a theme and, you know, a few newspapers wrote about the resilience of, of, you know, the children of Canada. And that's where I found a lot of value in this, you know, in being acknowledged as a diaspora uh, or being called that. It's not an easy thing to be called. It's not a title that I wanted to carry, but, you know, here we are. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think food is a, is a positive aspect of it. And um, I'm, I'm just hoping that people see it the way I do. Um, the other thing is, you know, when the Syrian refugees came to Canada, I realized, you know, these women were fresh out of the war. We opened up the kitchen at the Depreneur for, for them and they, we were cooking and they were employed and it was going really well. But, you know, being around these kids and women was very hard because, you know, I didn't show it, but I was actually, I think I had a tremor, you know, of the feelings and the emotions and feeling lost. And I just knew what to tell them. I knew what to say to them, even though they didn't speak English. I knew how to approach them. Um, you know, we would look at each other and there were tears shared and they couldn't understand why until I told them I was from Bosnia. And I said, you know, I was you not that long ago. It's going to be okay. I was your little kid, you know? So all those things are important. These are lessons learned. They're very harsh lessons. It's not easy to grow up like that, but um, there is value in it because it's not just about Bosnia. It's about so many other countries. Unfortunately, you know, wars are going to keep happening and people are going to keep fleeing. You know, the migration in Europe is, is above and beyond, you know, and so many other places as well. So I think we are, you know, we are sort of lucky to have learned the lessons and to kindly, you know, take others in and help guide them through this process because, you know, I, I think we really are all connected. It just takes time to see it. So that's that. So I'll leave it to that. And, and I, I guess the last thing, you know, speaking of diaspora, I was also very lucky to go to India for a book. Um, that's a book that's been put on hold. I, I'm not sure it, it will go on, but doesn't matter. The experience was phenomenal. You know, so I spent uh, two weeks in India and two weeks in Sri Lanka. And, you know, every day it was like lunch and dinner with a different chef and a different cook. And they would, of course, tell us stories. And, you know, then we came here and saw the difference in the spices and the cooking, um, how quickly things were made here. You know, although they were called authentic here. And I just thought to myself, well, this is not it's not authentic and I guess it's okay, but then can we call it authentic and how am I going to do this with the Bosnian food? So, you know, having traveled to so many places and seen it in its original country and here and having done the same in Bosnia, I think it's really important to spend time in Bosnia. Uh, and like I said, I, I had two visits two summers ago, but you know, I'm heartbroken that I can't be there because really, truly, I wanted to move there for a few months and just go through a lot of the food, talk to the people and the cooks and the chefs and, and the professors of history. But um, anyway, it's something that I hope to do after this other cookbook is done. But it's very important to go back to, to your roots and to that soil and uh, cook with the food there. So, you know, a diaspora coming home, I guess. Okay, so that's that. I'm sorry, my computer is funny, it jumps for some reason, here we go. So this was a larger kind of bird's eye view, I guess, um, of, of 
you know, why I'm doing this and why I find it important to talk about in this context. Um, you know, healing and living, you know, post-trauma, and I don't want to overuse that word, but I think it's important because it's not just like, oh, I saw bad things. It's like, no, I felt bad things and I saw bad things and, you know, I learned from those things and I don't want to see those things again. So we need to talk about these things. So for many years, I was living in survival mode. And I think that's why I was at CAMH at that hospital in psychiatry. And I realized when the clients would do better, you know, I would feel happier. You know, the resilience, it lifted me up as well. And it's not something that I liked, you know, having this sort of notion of, oh my goodness, Senya, you went through so much and you're so strong and, you know, you're resilient. And it would kind of annoy me, you know, a lot of the time. Um, because I felt like, yeah, you think I wanted to be resilient and strong? No, I didn't. It happened to you in a sense. Um, you know, and there are a lot of other things that have happened in my life post war that were quite awful. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad they happened because I learned so much from them. So, you know, the survival mode, it's when you're adapting and you're living to survive. And then you are in this healing mode over time with the right knowledge. And you all of a sudden you start to create. All of a sudden, my father starts to garden. He starts to go fishing. He teaches other kids how to make the fishing flies. You know, my mom starts doing her botany again, you know. Dad's writing poetry and calling me in. Hey, remember this lovely melody? And I wrote about it. So all these things start to happen and you realize, okay, so now we're back on, on the mode before it was horrific. So let's stay there. So that's, that's when I started connecting to people in Bosnia, you know, and uh, Slobodzina was very kind. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how they found me, but this was two summers ago. They kind of wrote a little article and then they wrote another beautiful article yesterday. So, you know, all this kind of connection to things and being acknowledged makes me feel like it's important and I kind of want to keep doing it. Um, because, you know, there's the PTSD aspect of our lives as a nation, but, you know, PTSD being post-traumatic stress disorder. But then, you know, there is something else that we don't know as much about, but, and we should know more about, and it's the post-traumatic growth. Um, I learned about this when I was going through my own health issues. One of the psychiatrists pulled me aside and said, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to bounce stronger. And I was offended when she said that, and I was annoyed. So... She said, no, it's actually, it's a fact and I wanted to read something about it. So she gave me a few journals at that time and I, my mind was blown because, you know, post-traumatic growth is a thing. Uh, maybe it should be talked about more than PTSD. You know, we also kind of talk about these negative and heavy things. And, um, you know, I think when we gather, these are the conversations we need to be having with our children, with our youth, with our parents. You know, we need to say we went through those things and they made us better. It, it, they're not here to diminish us. You know, th they hurt us, but it heals. So, you know, um, anyway, I, I, I'm sure most people here are aware of, of all these things, but I thought it was important to, to put it into this context because it's how I operate. You know, again, this community is immunity. Um, you know, back home, you were never alone. You couldn't even be alone because your neighbors were always around. You know, your doors were unlocked and you hear someone yelling and talking. And, you're playing with the kids. That's not how the northern, you know, hemisphere is, is set up. We don't have that here. So, you know, we have to find your people. And when you find them, you kind of realize that you feel better when they're around. And if you're alone for a long amount of time, you lose memory and you lose language and you lose, you know, recipes. So we have to practice the gatherings, I think, in community more actively in these countries. And it makes it harder, but I think it's possible. Um, you know, and I'm so glad to have so many Bosnian people here and that, you know, and from Mexico-Slavia as well. So, you know, if it's not food, it's music. Again, we, we talk about things or architecture, you know, uh, like when, you know, in, in New York, when they had that beautiful, beautiful Spominique, um, you know, installation, so many of us went there and found it phenomenal, you know, and, you know, so many artists that I've become friends with, Arnold Mahuto, which is going to be one of your other speakers, you know, we really do different things of expression, but truly um, it's a very similar experience. And um, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad we're here. And so not to get into clinical stuff too much either, but you know, talking about neuroplasticity and the ability for our brain to rewire itself, 
and our bodies also to kind of realign themselves, um, I think is important. And I think that can be done through diet and food education. Um, and again, growing up in such a healthy setting, drinking, you know, so many different teas for so many different ailments, literally feeling better and, you know, funny things like putting rakia all over your feet when you have fever. I do that because it helps me. I still do. And every friend of mine has similar things and we laugh at it. You know, it's like my mother called, she wants me to take a potato, shred it and put it on my belly. And they do. So, you know, these things are not folkloric. You know, we do feel better. There's memory attached to them. There's healing attached to them. And it would be nice to have, a, you know, a go-to, um, you know, a, a book, I suppose, you know, or, or some other format to remember these things. Well, um, you know, two things I, I wrote down and I just wanted to read out loud. It's like somebody wrote to me once, you know, you survived all the hard stuff. So you can survive the good stuff. So let's not be afraid of the good stuff. Let's bring back more of the good stuff. You know, whether it's food and music and memories, uh, you know, uh, old art, you know, old literature. You know, why, why aren't we reading these, these books that gave us so much joy before? Stuff like that, you know, I think we have to protect our time to spend it with things that are important to us and our heritage. Um, and then remembering that you really don't walk alone, you know, especially when, when you come to a country in Canada. You know, sometimes I'll just sit on a streetcar or I'll look out the window and look on clean and see, holy, this is amazing. It's people from, not anyone looks the same for half an hour. You just, it's, it's really incredible. So if you just stop and try to imagine what some of these people have gone through. Or if you go to a restaurant, for example, I have a Sri Lankan restaurant across the street becoming friends, um, you know, and their story of their political unrest and why they left. And my Bolivian friend, you know, and my Cuban friends, uh, we all have very similar stories. So this is kind of the, the meeting ground uh, and it helps us find our identity. Okay, here we go, computer, whenever you're ready. Okay, so this is my second last slide. So I wanted to talk about, you know, access and connection to other Bosnian diaspora. And, you know, I really didn't have to go far with this one because you guys came to mind. Uh, Kuma International is a place that I didn't know a lot of about, um, you know, until a few years ago, like last year, a year and a half ago through Admirala. And I, I just really want to say thank you because we are misplaced. Uh, and we were dispersed and it was not something that we chose. Um, and, you know, I, I always feel like I see this bomb coming in into the soil and from the detonation, everything just, you know, blows up and we just end up here or here, whether it's Canada or New Zealand, you know, or the States. And, you know, we have this common ground, but it's hard to go to when you go to Bosnia, right? And, and there's a lot of emotion tied to it. So when we have these structured events and platforms and other people who understand and are trying to rehabilitate themselves and their culture, um, it really extends our life. It extends our life as, as people who are almost, you know, extinguished. So um, anyway, I think you're doing very important work and I want to say thank you. But you know that I've told you and, and you know, I just hope you guys keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, so yeah, whoever doesn't know about Kuma International, please look it up. Um, I'm happy to guide you and Claudia here as well. Um, they do a lots of things, uh, but you know, I do want to say some of them, they have a spring and summer school. I don't know what's happening with COVID now, but I'm sure things will be back. They do a lot of exhibitions, these online things, artist talks, there's a lot of research, workshops, um, and so on and so forth. And so before I go to my last slide, you know, we talked about post-traumatic growth as well. So this is where I just want to say whatever pain that we may have been through, whether it was directly or indirectly, uh, whether you're from that generation or after, you know, the pain eventually can become the fuel. So not to be grateful for it, but to be grateful for the experience and to do things with it, to process it, because it, it weighs us down. Um, you know, and I know so many people and within my family, we've lost so many people from so many illnesses that started, you know, right after the war. And, um, you know, I do believe that the body keeps score, uh, as that book says, and um, we have to be careful how much we hold in and don't process in a gentle way. I think these things need to go through us. So let's not forget that um, in order to grow, sometimes you have to, to suffer. 
um, again, resilience is a gift, you know, once, once you realize it as that. So just, just be, be kind and be gentle, um, especially the younger generation where we're taught to live in a very fast tempo and uh, it's not natural, nor is it necessary. And again, the, the two last things that I think are very important to talk about is, you know, sadly, I, I feel that there's a little bit of a disconnect between, you know, my generation and the one before me and the few before me, because, you know, the other Bosnian artists, let's say, or writers or, or you know, musicians, you know, things are hard, but I, I, I feel I, I feel that there's a little disconnect between the older generations and the younger generations. Um, and, you know, I hope that that can be addressed a little bit. Um, I, I would hate to see a generational disconnect of a country that's already been so disconnected uh, and a nation that's been so divided. So I hope that, you know, as a diaspora, I hope we can mobilize some of that as well, but, um, and, and then connect back home. And um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, of urgent kind of attention in nature. And uh, I hope that we can, we can all kind of talk about that more and do something about it. Um, so let's see where that goes. So that's that. And then I, uh, I just wanted to leave everybody with a quote, really, because my dad called me last night and he goes, oh, okay, 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 I wrote something. And, and he says, you should, you should leave them with this, thinking that, you know, I probably wouldn't, but I, I do. And, you know, he says very something very simple. You know, so, you know, don't extinguish the fire or the flame of where you were born. You know, you can't do that because then you extinguish your existence and all that you are. So this is my ode to my town of Kluge, you know, and the river Sana, you know, and all those things that fed me and nourished me and my family. So I just wanted to leave everyone with that. And, and thank you again, to both to you and to Adna for everything that you guys did to, to make this happen. It was kind of a... I wasn't sure how it would work, but it, it's been phenomenal and so positive. And um, thank you. I don't really, I mean, I could talk a lot longer, but I, I do want to hear from others. And so if anybody has questions, I'll, maybe Claudia, you can um, take it from here. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you to you, Xenia, uh, for everything what you've been doing until today um, mm -hmm. of course for accepting our invitation even if we never met uh, in person um, but just through uh, social media i remember i still remember when i found your page on instagram and i saw uh, that you're a photographer that you're from bosnia you live in toronto in canada and of course i felt like a very um, nice vibes and the, the need to to reach out to you and uh, and tell you that kuma exists in sarajevo and uh, we are blessed to work with uh, amazing artists and people like you and so many others and as i was telling you before you know if you hadn't done like what you do you know if you if you and and the other people artists and colleagues and friends we work with you know, there will be no need for Kuma to exist. So um, I am the one uh, who is like most grateful uh, to you, like to the Bosnian people in diaspora, to the Bosnian people still living in Bosnia, you know. And for me as a person, and uh, also of course on a professional level, but personally, your stories have always been so inspiring. And there is always so much that I'm learning every day, you know, uh, living in Sarajevo and, and talking to people like you. So it's, it's really my, um, my pleasure. So I am the one who is thankful. Yeah. We have uh, some messages for you in the chat. Uh, Caroline had to leave a bit earlier. So she's writing, thanks, really interesting. Sorry, I have to leave now. It's the first set that night of Passover. Of okay. course, special foods feature. So yes. Jewish, yes. uh, Jewish friends celebrating tonight. Yes. And yes. Selma also, who is a, a good friend, and she was uh, one of our guests last year within the Artists in Conversation program. Uh, she also writes, thank you, Xenia, for sharing. Looking forward to our storytelling food edition. And then there is Jill, whom I don't know, maybe. Uh, she's from Toronto. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a friend of yours. Uh, thank you, Xenia. 
uh, this was a beautiful presentation and I appreciate you sharing your personal story that ultimately led you to where you are now. I love hearing about all the work you're doing. Um, Todd uh, is uh, our friend. He's based in New York. Uh, thank you, Xenia, for sharing your stories. He's a photographer, by the way. Uh, if you get back to New York City after this COVID-19 event, let me know and please leave in your email. Happily. <laughs> Amela, uh, Marin, amazing talk. Xenia, you are an inspiration. I absolutely agree. Amela is one of my inspirations. Amela, I hope you know that. Thank you for, for attending. And today is her son's birthday, that that is. So I, I, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm gonna call and, and sing him happy birthday. And then there is Hamza. Uh, this was my first, uh, this was my time first watching something from Kuma and I am amazed. Thank you Xenia for this very inspirational and useful talk. It was a pleasure. And again, as I was saying, uh, um, I think we can say that Kuma has been uh, successful in the sense that we really had the pleasure to work with, uh, to be working, you know, with so such amazing um, people. So um, if this is successful, if people are joining our talks and if we're having a good time, if we are learning from each other, if we are all able to share and offer a safe space for our stories and uh, memories and heritage, you know, I feel like I'm kind of a diaspora myself coming from Italy and living in Sarajevo. Of course, I have a complete different um, history, but uh, I do miss home. I do miss uh, family and food. And uh, so I guess every time I talk to somebody from the Bosnian and diaspora, there are just so many things that we, uh, of course, that we uh, share, like you and your, all your international friends in, uh, in Toronto. So um, I would uh, also open, of course, the floor if anybody else has any um, question to Xenia. You can even uh, drop a message in the chat or just feel free to turn on your camera and ask Xenia uh, directly. And uh, I think I have, uh, I mean, I had millions of uh, um, inputs, ideas when you were talking, but I would like to ask you about your friends in Bosnia, whether you still have... Mm -hmm. um, family and friends to come back to when you visit Bosnia and how is it do you cook with them I mean how do you spend your time when you when you when you're back when you're back home as you call it um I do I do I have mostly my mother's side of the family um you know she comes from a family of seven so a lot of them are also diaspora now you know from France to Germany to Australia but um the others that stayed are still in Cluj and they actually have started you know, food businesses just after the war and they are doing tremendously well. So they all have restaurants. So of course, when I go there, first thing I want to do is go eat at the restaurant and go in the kitchen. <laughs> and my aunt has to kick me out. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm looking at your recipe. She's like, get out. So then we go home and we cook. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, my family back home is so dear to me. Um, and we still have the land. My parents kept the land for my brother and I, you know, it's currently they're just donating the, for the farmers to use, but we do, we still go fishing mostly. We, you know, I, I don't like to go hunting with dad anymore. I just don't like to really go hunting much, but um, we still do the things that we did, you know, we'll go foraging, you know, I'll go to other cities. I mean, it's sad to go back because most of my friends have also left, you know, there's the brain drain. First there's the, the war, but then there's the brain drain. So yeah, we still get together. And if we do, we meet in Bosnia and that's kind of how we maintain our friendship and family relations together, which is fine. You know, I love Bosnia, I miss Bosnia so much. Um, last summer I went for six weeks and I came here and I was really unhappy. So I just decided to go back. So two weeks later, I was back there for like two months. and. It felt so much better. So yeah, we still we still maintain those relations when possible. I hope I can go fishing with you next time you come to you come to Boston. I would love to visit your place and and go fishing or just walking around. And the nature is amazing. But as you know, uh, even rivers here are very endangered. You know, there is a lot of pollution and. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and you know some of the dams that are being built, um, you know, legally and illegally, and uh, you know Patagonia just did a really good big feature on it, and so people are talking about these things. But 
you know, nobody can help unless you know. So we, we need to we need to know what's going on a bit more so we can help. Yes, absolutely. This could be another uh, Kuma project, uh, but we will wait for you to uh, come come back and see us and visit us here in Sarajevo, and then we can plan. Yes. Yes. Is there anyone anyone who would like to ask a question to Xenia? Yes, I see someone waving here. Uh, I don't see that. I'm sorry. Um, maybe Xenia, would you would you please stop sharing your screen? Because I, sure. I can't yes. see. Thank you so much. Because I can't see. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Now I can see. Hello. <laughs> now I can see all our guests. Tiana, that's really nice. Hi. Um, so was there somebody who had a question? Oh, Tiana. Yes, please. Just, um, hi. Hello, hi, hi Claudia, hi everybody. I mean, it's not really a question as such, it's more like a comment because it's, um, it's very close to the uh, topics I'm um, interested in myself as a curator, because you mentioned that the, it, um, the um, diaspora as a, as a term is very difficult also to accept. And this is also my experience talking to the artist. It's a, it's a quite, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that can feel, um, artificial or not really uh, fitting in, 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 in the idea one wants to have about um, the artistic practice or career or something. So I have been also thinking about what it is. And um, basically you have been um, very good in explaining the, the three like main terms of diaspora as it is explained uh, theoretically, the, the dispersal, you explained very well uh, with, the, with the visually how everybody was uh, spread and also that you, your family actually um, changed the the, um, the place of stay of, of um, where you lived uh, from Berlin and then to Canada and so on and um, in that sense um, it's interesting also to talk about like this idea of the periphery and center because this person in itself has a kind of center and then there is a periphery everywhere else so it's interesting for people who live in diaspora to think about also like if it if they feel like living in periphery comparing to the center or the other way around, what is center, what is periphery? I guess this is also the, one of the biggest uh, dilemmas. Um, the second one is the home orientation that you also explained very well, especially with the food, that it's actually your way of um, okay. think, or performing this home orientation through the storytelling and um, um, activating the, the memories. And, um, and then this last one, which would be the group solidarity, the third aspect, which you also explained very well, um, both when it comes to connection to maybe other diasporas uh, from Bosnia around the world uh, through Kuma and maybe as other similar uh, platforms, but also to diasporas from other countries living where you live. And this is also very interesting because I think that um, more and more um, people living in what is called diaspora, they experience this more transcultural aspect of the diaspora that you actually um, recognize similarities uh, with other diasporas and in that way also negotiate and question this idea of what is the what is actually the culture what is actually nation and 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 what is um, all these um, frames that we navigate within that being questioned this is this is the quite this is what would be explained as a difference between the multicultural and transcultural Yes. So I think it's really, you touched upon quite a many uh, very good aspects uh, of it. Um, so it was not a question, it was just to say that you, with your food story, um, actually uh, managed to um, not challenge, but maybe some, somehow like uh, uh, put a question mark about all of these categories that diaspora uh, is traditionally uh, explained uh, through. And I think it's very, very important because I believe that the, the term diaspora is, is has to, has to change as well because we are not in the, the in the uh, classical diaspora time anymore. Uh, and I think that the transcultural approach could be one of the ways to to shake the classical one. So this was be, to be my my main uh, co comment. And then just an, as an extra comment, like a PS comment would be about um, the trauma in nature. Because I have been working with some artists, uh, visual artists, who are in their artworks also 
connecting these two because the post-traumatic stress um, 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 uh, disorder um, actually connects these two in the way that many we see many many people who uh, who go to the forest they escape uh, they after coming back from the war like war veterans uh, they would uh, leave the cities and they would go very far away where there is no civilization they would escape and it's not happening only with the people living in bosnia who uh, uh, who uh, have uh, traumas after the war but also in, in denmark where i live danish soldiers who have been in the war and come back to denmark they in a very, you know, imagine Denmark is very clean. There is all the forest is organized. There are, you know, paths and everything. Even here, they would find places where it's more wild and they would build some small houses just to escape. And they would live in the most simple life. And it, there are studies about that, why it is important, and where, what is the pattern. And some of the people that, they have, that have been interviewed, they said that they are somehow, I, I'm not quoting, I'm just trying to remember, uh, they are, they're trying to, uh, um, the society that put them in this situation of going to war and losing their balance, so they want to get away from that. So they go to the nature as running away from the society that damaged them, uh, something like that. Um, so it's really interesting to connect the trauma and the nature. Um, and you do it with, through food. So that's the, the bridge I can see. That was all for me. <laughs> Can I, can, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the terminology and, and kind of contextualizing it. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, and when you did this, when you're like, you kind of did this with the food, that's sort of what it feels like. You know, I feel like, you know, I feel like a thread, you know, and I'm just or like, you know, I always think of that, that photo I took in, in, uh, in uh, God in Shabichi with all the mountains, you know, and it's like, if it was one stone, but then there was this line of things that happened over time, you know, and that line is ancient, you know, and there was always food, there was always nature, there was always folkloric, you know, communication with people. And those are the ancient things that we have. We come from that. I'm just a little, you know, expansion of that big root. We can't underestimate that, the ancestral knowledge that we have and, and connection to nature. It's beyond any medication that I have seen. You know, we just have to, we have to be able to let go, to tap into that connection. You know, not everybody is that fortunate, but I, I do think it's possible. And I think it's very important. So thank you for that. Thank you, Tiana. It was also really nice to see you. And now I can see also Todd and I can see Velma. It's really nice that we are here yeah. together. Um, I think we have a question apart from other uh, comments. Uh, Amela is also th saying thank you to Kuma for uh, what you're doing. This is very important work. Uh, thank you. But again, my thank, uh, my thank you goes to uh, Xenia and all the um, artists out there doing very important work. Um, our friend from FICA crew, um, it was great to hear and see your strength throughout hard times and appreci appreciation for the good times. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. And Hamza, uh, Hamza has a question. Do you have any advice or tips for someone young who is just starting photography career and studying creative visual studies in Bosnia? I do, Hamza. Uh, thanks for the question. I, um, you know, my, my one advice that I give to my other friends who are starting photography is to photograph a lot in different lights, in different settings. Uh, challenge yourself, make a mistake and fix it. Um, find something that speaks to you, you know, it could be fashion photography, but it could be documentary photography. You know, for me, it's now food. Um, you know, before I was working with musicians and concerts. Um, you know, as you change your subjects and your attachments to your subjects will change. So you have to kind of keep working on, on what makes you who you want to be and then kind of go with that. I think it helps. So whatever you're doing, just keep doing it, but do more of the actual photo taking because I think it's very important. You know, I also try to tell people photography can seem overly technical a lot of the time, but truly if you have a camera that you understand, 
And if you have natural light and access to natural light, you're okay. You don't really need anything else. I mean, my first cookbook, I was asked to go in a studio and I was given a studio and I did a chapter in it and I didn't enjoy it. There was no connection to it. Uh, there were lights everywhere. It was hot. It was stuffy. There was no natural element to the food. So I said, I'm not doing this. I'm not, so, you know, either I do it my way or I don't really want to do it. And I was lucky enough that they agreed and I showed them, you know, here's 10 recipes that I've done in this setting that I feel more comfortable in. And it was, it was just better work. So uh, know your light, but do embrace natural light. You always want the natural light kind of to, to guide you. So now I, like I, I can, I can happily say I'm, this is my third book and all of them, you know, the, my clients kind of know, uh, I work with natural light. Of course I use flash if I have to, but it's not something that I would, I always hesitate and I always try to find a way of not to, to take it away because, you know, I believe that a photograph, you know, is, is a document and it's how you, I see it. It's not something that's curated to me if it's documentary. So I always try to keep that in mind. Uh, Enrico, who is also a photographer and he's working with us at Kuma, he's giving another tip to Hamza saying that he should uh, read a lot, uh, a lot of books that will help focus on the visual world. And I agree. Yeah. And Hamza, if you, if you, I don't know where you live in Bosnia, but if you, um, if you would need like any other advice or that we put you in contact with photographers or visual artists, we would be very happy to do this. Uh, so just feel free to reach out to us. Claudia, how do you feel about us uh, showing the little video about... Yes, uh, yes kind of, absolutely. I don't know if everyone's okay. It's not very long. I believe it's like three, four minutes. So I'm happy to share it if you still think it's a good idea. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's see how we do this. So it's here. Um, share screen. Brings me to back to the presentation. So this is a video that was created by um, uh, a group of film directors and producers who were looking for, you know, people who came to Canada um, and, and their stories to, to their homeland and how they've assimilated here. Um, and we were chosen as our family and it was, it was a really beautiful little project. So they did this mini doc and I see now that it's longer, it's about seven minutes, but it's uh, something I enjoy watching. So I'm just going to wait for everyone. My name is Dervish Fotic. All my life, I am a fisherman. My father teach me and take it me because I am oldest son, and uh, I see how my father catches the fish, and uh, that's my first impression in in, in my life. We grew up in a city where you, you were surrounded, you lived in a canyon, you know, you drive into the city through a canyon, you leave it through a canyon, and there's a river going through it. It's just impossible not to, to be a nature person. Nature is some total peace. You're going and you are peace of this. It's river, piece of river, it's creek, you are piece of the creek. It's stone, you're like a stone. Yes or no? That's, that's how I, I'm thinking about you know, this. You're becoming a part of it, right? A part of the, your surrounding. Contact. Or, or yeah, I'm just saying it, that's it's yeah. a part of being yeah. in contact with, with it. It's beautiful. Just the people don't, don't have a time to, to, to look it, to touch it, to do it. You're just going with there is there is something to the motion. It's, it's true. It's it's kind of a meditative state that he gets in. I mean, I'll be like that, 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 and it's like he's gone. 
and then like okay fine then i'll join you and then i do my own thing and it really puts you in that yeah. meditative state and it's yeah, beautiful great. right on uh -huh. and then three hours later you haven't said a word to each other but you're not bored maybe you're hungry and then you'll talk to each other but that's it so it's yeah it's it's therapeutic i think in a, in a sense too I mean, just sitting here and talking about this really is kind of bizarre to me. Like we're in Canada. Like my grandma had a postcard of Toronto with a skyline, the CN Tower, okay, because we had family here. And as kids, we would like stare at this far away land, you know, Toronto. Wow. It's kind of bizarre. I never thought in a million years that we would even travel to Toronto. Never mind living in this weird city that you saw on the postcard as a kid. It's surreal. I was 11 when it started in Bosnia. I never saw it coming, really, although my stomach knew it was coming. As a little kid watching the news, I knew it was coming. And everyone was in denial, saying, it's not going to come here. There's no way. Everyone gets along. When the war broke out in Bosnia uh, in 1992 in April, it started in our region, and it stuck around for a very long time and just changed everything. How you look at your people you thought were your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues. We were separated, almost killed, but we made it out alive. So when people found us, they were quite intrigued. I mean, he was a special guy for the youth, and he was a poet and a writer, and he would take the kids out of school and say, screw school today, I got the principal to take us all tree plants and let's go. And there was a group of these young men who struggled in their own lives and throughout the war and they wrote all these letters to that so this is a letter from another one of the students who he was actually the godfather to him so the letter goes as such long ago you used to call me little godchild it was very dear to me because it was only a nickname that i could have from you yeah. i read the emails that you and dushko exchanged my friend, way before the war. And in our talks, you came up. I needed a lot of time to understand that you weren't just a teacher, but you were a mentor. I now live in Sarajevo. I'm married. I have two sons. Dear teacher, please write back. He wants to thank you guys for bringing out the memories for the opportunity to feel this way. Yeah, I know. It's okay. Yeah, we haven't read this stuff since I don't think I ever heard him read it out loud. Fish on them. Oh, I got a fish on them. I got a big one too. But I'd like to get a shot. Oh, there's a jumper, huh? This one is big one. Nice fish. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Nice fish. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous. It's going be tasty, bugger. Hold it, honey. Hold it. I'm jealous. I remember my father uh, going in fishing and bring it to the house and neighbor coming one, two, three, four, and mother say, hmm, again, I have to make it two more bread for these people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, there's a communal part of, of fishing for him. So yeah. he would bring a lot of fish home and he would share it with the neighbors or the students. It wasn't just something he would bring home and freeze, no. You share it. Okay. Everybody don't have a good 
good table. I'm lucky. I, I always have a, have a good, good fish and nice table to respect in my house. We got our stuff and we got the trout from today, made this morning. You know, you have to be lucky. Okay. For for this, it's all this, all this, how it is. That's my my stories. <laughs> Thank you, Ksenia, for sharing this video. It was beautiful. Thank you. It always makes me emotional. Yeah. Is that me? Sorry, guys. That's some background yeah, my name is music. Mike Snake. I'm the executive chef of Chase Hospitality Group. That should group. not be happening. There we go. Thank you. I got emotional as well. <laughs> it was a really beautiful video. Yeah. It's a nice memory to have. Yes, very much. Okay, any other questions or is there anything else that um, I can expand on or? Uh, Hamza is saying uh, such a beautiful way to tell a story and overall this talk was really great. Wonderful, thank you Hamza. Mm, I agree. So I don't have to forgot to say that we are having two more uh, talks uh, happening in April. So in two weeks, we will talk to Damir Abdajic um, who is in Norway, and at the end of April on the 24th uh, with Arnala Mahmutovic, who is following us tonight. Um, so we will send out, of course, uh, our newsletter. We will announce it on social media, but I would love uh, to see you um, again for the next two talks with the artists from Bosnia who now live in, in the Aspen. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, during the summer, we will be able to have more talks, but in person. Um, actually, I have to say, but uh, most people here know that I, I, I was really against Zoom last year. Um, I was really heartbroken that we could not run our activities in person and sitting all together and talking and learning from each other. And then, of course, we were forced to go online on Zoom, but it's just uh, actually, it works. It still works uh, very well. And of course, we are able to reach uh, so many people and, you know, it's, uh, it, it is actually great. And it still feel really homey and cozy and, um, you know, uh, you, can, you can feel like very good vibes. And thank you. So thank you to everybody who's been um, joining us tonight. Also a big thank you to Adna Muslia. I, I see Adna is still with us. Uh, so Adna is a young artist from Bosnia. She lives in Sarajevo and uh, I am so lucky because we've been working together for a few months now and she's been making these beautiful videos uh, introducing our guests at the uh, Artists in Conversation um, program. And uh, all the videos that Anna made were super beautiful. And this one, this last one with you, Xenia, uh, especially. So I was telling you also, there was like a very nice reaction on social media. Everybody was sharing the video. So thank you, Adna, one more time. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, that really was a pleasure to work with Adna as well. Um, you know, just very, very good and very quick and creative. And uh, it's very nice to have somebody that feels like an extension of your brain as another creative. So it's wonderful that she's there with you. Um, and then just before I go, I actually wanted to share this. So this is one of my, one of my friends that I had from Anila, um, who, who was kind enough to share it with me. And um, it's called the Golden Lily. So I definitely will be tuning in for the other two and Anila's becoming a friend. Um, I think she's incredible and I hope more people can, can uh, go look her up as well. I also have the same, um... Uh, the same work from Anna Lada. She was kind enough to give it to me as a present. So I have it framed here in my apartment in Sarajevo. Uh, Velma, uh, Velma Babic, with whom we talk, she's a good friend and a photographer, artist from Boston, living in Germany. She's saying, thank you, Ksenia, for this great presentation and video. Uh, yes, I got tears in my eyes too. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, 
Yes. It's nice to share our emotions with, with everyone, even if it's on Zoom, you know, I guess. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for leading this and, and organizing it over and over again. I know it probably isn't easy for you either to do it online, but you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. It's getting better and better, so I'm not, I'm not complaining. Yes, they were not having any Zoom issues these days, so it's also okay. You know, technology is not failing us, which is good. Uh, Arna also saying big thanks to you, Xenia, and Claudia. It was my pleasure. And Arnala, thank you, Xenia. You are an absolute inspiration to me. I feel the same. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. So, Xenia, thank you so, so much once again for your time, for sharing your story, for everything what you've been doing. And um, I really hope to meet you in person. I mean, I feel like I know you now, you know, for, for, for so long, but we still haven't met in person, which I really hope it will happen soon. Well, thank you. Thank you and Kuma and, and all the work and everyone for tuning in. And more than anything, I would love to spend time in, in Bosnia, you know, in Sarajevo. So as soon as I can, I will be there and we will, we will meet in person and uh, maybe cook something together. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Xenia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good, uh, good rest of the day or good evening, and uh, I'll see you soon. Yes. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Xenia. Bye. Pleasure.